So today we have speaking, uh, Jay Kwabena Asmoe Giyadu is the Beta Grau Professor of Contemporary African Christianity and Pentecostal Theology at Trinity Theological Seminary in Accra, Ghana. He also serves as the Vice President of the seminary. He served as a visiting scholar at Harvard University, Lutheran Seminary. He was a senior resident scholar at OMSC here in New Haven. And most recently at Yonsei International University in Songdu, South Korea. He's the author of the African Charismatics, Contemporary Pentecostal Christianity. He's a co-editor with Kenneth Ross and Todd Johnson on Christianity in Sub-Saharan Africa, which was released by Edinburgh University Press in 2017. He's a co-editor with Frieder Ludwig of African Christian Presence in the West. He's the lead editor of Between Babel and Pentecost, Migrant Readings from Africa, Europe, and Asia. That's going to be published by Peter Lang. Kobena has published many articles in international journals relating to Christianity as a non-Western religion. He's married to Theodora, who is with him today. So welcome. So we're ha happy to have both of you here. So uh, last time we were together was in, in Ghana in March, and we had a very good time. You hosted as well, so we, we hope to do the same to you. So thanks. Uh, good evening, and um, I'd like to uh, thank uh, Michael for warm words of introduction, and also to thank my senior friend and colleague, Lamin, and both of you for bringing me here. Um, of course, as you said, my wife is here, and also it's good to be in the midst of familiar faces. Um, everybody here is familiar, so mm -hmm. I probably can say what I like and get away with it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, the um, topic that I have um, chosen to speak on is actually one that I'm still um, developing. Um, I've titled this one, Jerusalem, My Happy Home, Exploring Pluralism, Democratic Governance, and Christian Pilgrimage as Religious Equalization in Contemporary Africa. My understanding is that you heard something about Nigeria last week, um, but it's impossible to mention Africa without Nigeria. <laughs> and I, I do tell my friends who visit Africa that once they've been to Ghana and Nigeria, um, they are covered. Uh, they don't have to go anywhere else. So it's good, it's good to be here. Now, so this presentation reflects and on and articulates a religious and theological response to the development of Jerusalem as a place of pilgrimage for Christians in Africa. Now, in new hermeneutics uh, involving its religious significance as equal to Mecca, the biblical Jerusalem has been reinvented and developed as an important pilgrimage location in contemporary African countries. There are agitations for sponsorship with some Christians requesting governments to help support such pilgrimages in the same manner in which Muslims are supported to perform the Hajj in Mecca. Now, most of my examples for this discussion come from Ghana with some references to the situation in Nigeria. Pilgrimage is understood here as basically a religious activity. And I distinguish it from tourism, although um, there is such an expression as religious tourism. The two are related, but not the same. That is tourism and pilgrimage. Because tourism is usually a social and recreational activity and religious tourism often takes people to sites that possess historical religious significance. Pilgrimage, on the other hand, is a conscious attempt to visit and perform religious activity at physical locations associated with supernatural revelations, power, and presence. I speak here of that which Mecha Eliade would describe in terms of a hierophany and that is 
supernatural revelations of power and presence. In religious terms, the tradition that is most popularly associated with pilgrimage is Islam. In religious terms, that is what we have all come to know. And the reason for this is not hard to find, that the Hajj or pilgrimage is an important pillar in Islam. Now, pilgrimage is also is not unknown in Christianity. And within Christianity, the stream that comes closest to the performance of pilgrimage as an institutionalized religious activity is Roman Catholicism. For example, Our Lady of Lord's Grotto in France, which has been in existence since some Marian apparitions there in the middle of the 19th century, and the papacy in Rome, are two of the most prominent sites for Catholic pilgrimages. If you come to Africa, the African independent churches have also developed their own pilgrimage sites. For example, in the Belgian Congo, the burial site of uh, Simon Kimbangu, one of the leaders of the, one of the most prominent African independent churches, uh, was buried in a place called Nkamba, Jerusalem. And that location has become an important pilgrimage site. In Ghana, where I live, uh, Mozano is another pilgrimage site, and that is where the founder of, the, of that independent church has been buried. In other words, Christians have developed their own pilgrimage sites, both locally and internationally. Now, what I do here is to examine the import of an invitation from the government of Ghana to Christians for sponsorship for pilgrimages to Jerusalem. I look at the political fallout from this invitation, the theological significance of such a pilgrimage based on responses from various Christian organizations that got involved in the drama. Now, the argument from sections of the public suggesting that government support for a pilgrimage to Mecca was a misplaced priority. And this was not surprising because people felt that pilgrimage is a religious activity and whether we are talking about Christians or we are talking about Muslims, the government should not get involved. There was a private advertisement that was put on in newspapers in Ghana advertising for people to apply if they wanted to go on pilgrimage to Jerusalem. And very interestingly, this, this advertisement described the experience in Jerusalem as a fifth gospel. We have the four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And the advertisement explained that the fifth gospel, the, the, the four gospels, are what you, you read. The fifth gospel is what you experience. And you experience the fifth gospel by going to Jerusalem. Now, I argue in the paper that factors such as multi-party democracy with its need for popular votes, the desire for dominance of public space, through what I call religious equalization in all areas of national life, from politics to education, by the two Abrahamic religions of Christianity and Islam, have contributed immensely to the developments in which Christians and Muslims contest for religious visibility through pilgrimage. Media technology has become a critical facilitator of these contexts in religious equalization. During a personal visit to Israel in May 2015, I was surprised to see people connect with important places listed in the Bible in a certain intense religious manner. For example, when we got to the upper room, there were people there praying 
for a fresh outpouring on the, of the Holy Spirit upon their lives, as happened to the apostles on the day of Pentecost. I met a group of African Catholics from Zimbabwe celebrating the Mass with about 10 bishops in attendance, and they were there in their full Episcopal vestments. And after the Mass, they visited a couple of places, and as I noted, treating Jerusalem as if it were a Christian Mecca. The questions I ask are, what is the religious theological significance of the development of Jerusalem into a pilgrimage location in a fashion similar to what we find with Mecca in Islam? Now, this question is pet pet uh, pertinent for me because in Christianity, at least from a biblical viewpoint, pilgrimage has not been institutionalized. So what does the attempt to institutionalize Jerusalem as a pilgrimage center mean for a faith that has become a minority faith in the place of its birth, for example? In Ghana, the news about Jerusalem and its institutionalization as a place of pilgrimage first came up in the newspapers. The first newspaper to publish this was a paper called The Daily Guide. And as it turned out, this was in 2013, the government, through its Minister of Youth and Sport, was facilitating this pilgrimage to Jerusalem through the provision of resources. The president of the country then had to come out to explain why this was being done. One of the reasons given was that the press in Jerusalem were to help reverse some of the economic difficulties that the country was supervising, was, was experiencing. The statement of the government read in part, and I'm, I'm going to read the full statement, part of the statement to you. It says, over the years, various Christian and church organizations have called on government to sponsor and address the various challenges that they have encountered during their holy trips to Israel. It is in response to all these several calls that the government then decided to facilitate and coordinate the pilot pilgrimage to Israel to help address some of the, some of the challenges Christian groups have encountered on past trips, which is nothing new, as government has been doing for the Holy Muslim pilgrimage to Mecca. It is deeply heartwarming that even at the time of listening to this statement, several Christian organizations, churches, and pastors have requested, appealed, and submitted names to be added to the list. For them, the opportunity to trace the footsteps of Jesus Christ and walk where he walked, pray for their families, their churches, and their country is an opportunity they do not want to miss and a potential life-transforming event. End of quote. So this is a government statement when it came under fire for using state, response, uh, state resources to sponsor a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. The whole point was that Muslims were being supported. And therefore, if Christians are making the request, government has no option but to support the Muslims to go on their pilgrimage to Jerusalem. Now, we thought that was the end of the matter. But this year, the new government has sponsored at least two trips to Jerusalem, which means that the whole idea of the development of Jerusalem as a pilgrimage has become part of the government agenda. The debate on whether the sponsorship by government of religious pilgrimages to continue or not is still being debated in public. I 
took note of some of the views expressed by members of the public. And I'll read just two of them for you. One person wrote in the mirror, which is a very important uh, weekend paper in Ghana. One person wrote, I can't for a minute understand why a government with so many responsibilities is keen on facilitating the pilgrimage of 200 pastors to Jerusalem. The point is to be made, however, that the government has no business sponsoring religious activities. There is a clear case of misplaced priority and insensitivity on the part of both government and the so-called men of God. That's somebody's view against government sponsorship of pilgrimages. There is one that supported the whole idea. And I'll read that one for you too. I don't think it is out of place for government to coordinate the pilgrimage to Jerusalem. There have been calls by the Christian Committee on Government to sponsor and address the various challenges they have encountered during their holy trips to Israel. And it is in response to these several calls that government decided to facilitate and coordinate this pilgrimage so as to address some of the challenges Christian groups encountered on past trips. This facilitation for me is nothing new, just as government has been doing for the Muslim pilgrimage to Mecca. End of quote. So we have two people here responding to pilgrimages. One against it, the other for it. Now the reference to government-sponsored Muslim pilgrimage and back on pilgrimage to Mecca, in the mirror viewpoint that I have read, is very significant. A number of Christian leaders interested in the project pointed to the sponsorship for Christian pilgrimages as deserved because already government was sponsoring Muslims. And that is why I call this an exercise in religious equalization. If we are doing it for the Muslims, then you've got to do it for us too. That was the argument. Unfortunately, the Christian churches in Africa, particularly Ghana and Nigeria, have never spoken with a single voice on this matter of pilgrimages and government sponsorship. In the particular case before us, the responses from churches regarding the appropriateness or otherwise of a government facilitated Christian pilgrimage to Israel were varied and the debate is still ongoing. The Ghana Catholic Bishops Conference, the Christian Council of Ghana, and the Ghana Pentecostal and Charismatic Council largely reject the offer of a privately sponsored and government facilitated pilgrimage to Israel. Now, that is not to say that when given the opportunity, individual members and leaders would necessarily reject the offer to go on pilgrimage to Jerusalem. The official responses from these churches gave two reasons for the rejection of the government-sponsored pilgrimage. The first was that pilgrimage to Israel was not to be prioritized over problems facing the country. Second, that prayers for Ghana would be effective when offered in the country, or let's say equally effective when offered on location. However, there were also Christian leaders, mainly belonging to the independent charismatic streams of the faith, who were all for the Christian pilgrimage. The general line of thinking has been that since the sponsorship of the Hajj is not going to stop, the Christian community may as well accept whatever the government will be able to do for them in that direction. After all, in Nigeria, Christian churches benefit from sponsorship to Jerusalem. So why not in Ghana? Indeed, as it turned out, some independent pastors with connections in government had started requesting for such sponsorships under the previous administration. It is thus important to place our discussion 
within the context of the historical relationship between Christianity and Islam in Ghana and also in Nigeria. The information from the religious statistical data from Nigeria is that the country, in terms of numbers, is split equally between Christianity and Islam. The case of Ghana is slightly different in that officially, Islam commands 15% of the population, but Christianity has 70%. Except for a few and sporadic skirmishes, the two faiths have lived in peace, especially in Ghana. In November 2017, that is this month, the Christian Association of Nigeria paid a courtesy call on the president of the country, Muhammad Buhari. Addressing the president, one Reverend Dr. Samson Ulasupu Ayokunle, president of the association, thanked President Buhari for receiving them and assured him that he was in their prayers during his surgeon abroad to seek medical care. For our purposes, there are three things in the address that this person gave that are important for us. The, the, the president of the Christian Association of Nigeria requested the president of the country, Muhammad Buhari, to withdraw Nigeria from religious organizations such as the Organization of Islamic Cooperation. It also pleaded with the government to help Christians in the north to gain quickly what is referred to as certificate of occupancy for churches. When you are going to build a church in northern Nigeria, you need a certificate of occupancy. And the idea was that the Muslim governors were making it difficult for Christians to obtain such certificates. And then the third request to the government of Nigeria was to address the lopsided nature of political appointments in, in Buhari's government because it seemed to them that as a Muslim president, he was favoring Muslims in the appointment to political office. The situation in Ghana is not dissimilar. In post-colonial Ghana, Muslim community leaders established English Arabic schools in response to the impact and influence of Christian mission schools in the country. These bilingual schools were created to provide Muslim families with an alternative to sending their children to Christian mission schools. Their principal goals were to prepare students to compete for positions in government business and other professions and to inhibit the possibility of Muslim children converting to Christianity. So they established this English and Arabic schools for Muslim children because they did not want Muslim children to grow up in mission schools in Ghana. The leaders of industry and public service in Ghana have since the colonial era been overwhelmingly Christian because Christians took edu formal education seriously. Christian evangelization in sub-Saharan Africa has right from the outset taken place through formal education. Islamic communities were suspicious of the mission schools, fearing that their children who studied in these schools would convert to Christianity. And so the principal goal of the English Arabic schools was for the protection or insulation of Muslim children from Christian influence and Islamization through formal education within a system of religious socialization. The Muslim teachers intended the schools as centers of missionary outreach and to help Muslim children compete with their Christian compatriots when it came to occupying responsible positions in public service. So the point is that the contest has already, had, has already been going on within the arena of education. And this is important for the Muslim community 
because there are large numbers of children of Islamic background who were out of the regular school system. And in Ghana, and I believe this exists in other parts of Africa too, Islam has been associated with lack of formal education. And this is very evident in the labor front, where a lot of menial jobs in the country, especially uh, security work, is associated with uh, Muslims. It doesn't mean that it's only Muslims who do that work. But because education within the Muslim community is not very strong, we find them in all these menial, doing these menial jobs. Early this month, the Parliament of Ghana started considering a bill to create what is called the Zongo Development Fund. There are Zongos everywhere in Ghana, and these are deprived communities usually occupied by Muslims. And so there is this attempt to try and, as it were, help young Muslim children to be able to compete with their Christian compatriots. And that's how I think this whole debate on Muslim and Christian pilgrimage should be understood. In fact, in 2012, Sunday Oguntola, a Nigerian, wrote an article for Christianity Today. The title was, Do Pilgrims Progress? It talked about how many Nigerian pilgrims took such pride in knighting themselves as JP, Jerusalem Pilgrim, on return from the pilgrimage. The Nigerian government sponsors almost 100,000 Muslim pilgrims to Mecca annually. The Christian sponsorship caters for about a third of the Muslim figure, and that's in Nigeria. So it seems to me that Ghanaian Christians are taking a cue from their friends in Nigeria who have been receiving support from government to go on pilgrimage. So I make the case that the attempt by Christians in Ghana and Nigeria to seek government sponsorship for pilgrimage to Jerusalem and citing the sponsorship of Muslim pilgrimages as an example of their demand amounts to pursuing religious equalization. It is like suggesting that since we all pay taxes, Christians must be sponsored in the same manner that Muslims are sponsored. Akinade has noted how the world over, relations between Christianity and Islam have gone through many incarnations marked by dialogue, polemics, cordial disputations, and vitriolic confrontations. The government is vulnerable in the face of such requests because this amounts to forms of religious patronage from which some political advantage could be obtained through votes at the polls. There is some attempt to mechanize Jerusalem, that is to turn Jerusalem into a Mecca, the Christian equivalent of Mecca within democratic Africa. We introduce this work by referring to the fact that religious pilgrimages occur in different streams of Christianity, especially Catholicism. There are local, national, international grottoes in Catholicism where the faithful visit to pray and to seek Marian interventions for various aspects of life. Jerusalem, however, does not have the same significance in the Christian faith as Mecca has in Islam. It is, however, little wonder that sections of the leadership of the church and members of the public continue to point out in media discussions that God is not bound by space and time and prayers offered anywhere reach him. Islam is a religion that is rooted in specific geographical places, Mecca and Medina, to which faithful Muslims are expected to make a holy pilgrimage in the course of their lifetimes. Beyond that, Islam is also connected to a single language, Arabic. And the Quran, as we know, is memorized and recited around the world in Arabic. 
and translations of the Quran into other languages are usually not considered genuine and inspired expressions of its truth. Indeed, in Christianity, the democratization of the Bible altered patterns of authority, power, and governance in the life of the church, and the Christian message was no longer in the custody of any group of interpreters. So there's some difference there. On the substantive issues of pilgrimage between Christianity and Islam, I argue that whereas in Islam, pilgrimage constitutes a major pillar of the faith, Christianity has no such historically recommended geographical center of religious ritual. In other words, beyond tourist interests, and its ability to help the Christian pilgrim encounter the place of Jesus' birth and ministry. Jerusalem has no religious significance for historic Christianity. As we know, the Christian faith became detached from its geographical center in Jerusalem within the first, within the first two generations of existence. In the New Testament, the church spread to the cosmopolitan city of Antioch, which became the center of its missionary outreach throughout the Roman Empire. While 2,000 years of history include Jerusalem falling and being destroyed by enemies and then being recaptured in various ongoing conflicts through the centuries, the vitality and growth of the Christian faith were not dependent on the status of its geographical origins. In fact, Christianity is one of only two world religions the other being Buddhism, that remains a minority faith in the place of its birth. The faith has also not been disseminated in the language of its founder. And in the biblical accounts, we hear Jesus, for example, telling the woman of Samaria, Believe me, woman, a time is coming when all worship, all who worship the Father, will do so neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. A time is coming and has come when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshippers the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshippers must worship him in spirit and in truth. Mecca. The original theater of the revelation of Islam has retained its religious significance for all Muslims. And this is demonstrated in the Qibla, the direction in which they turn in prayer. Jesus' direction in terms of where to pray did not refer to any particular geographical location or place. When you pray, he said, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your father who is an unseen. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. In this direction, Andrew Walls, speaking about the translatability of Christianity, notes, Christians have no abiding city, no permanent sacred sites. Their new Jerusalem comes out of heaven on the last day. End of quote. It was after the exile that Jerusalem was rebuilt with the second temple, which became an important center for worship and a focus of Israel's religious and cultic identity. That was obviously not the last temple, but the Jews, in terms of their importance, saw each of them as sacred places for the worship of Yahweh. Douglas Davis explains the continuing relevance of Jerusalem in terms of its theological place in Christian thought, saying, the idea of a heavenly Jerusalem in Christian thought offers a dramatic example of the way an actual place comes to function symbolically as an expression of faith and hope. Pilgrimage is a very important religious activity for many religions, including certain streams of Christianity, as I have noted Jeru uh, Roman Catholicism, for example. They are undertaking to various grottos, including to lords in France, which I have mentioned, one of the most important places of pilgrimage. But we have argued that although pilgrimage is not alien to Christianity, at the official, theological, and institutional levels, 
it does not carry the same weight as it does in Islam. The sponsorship of the more organized and centralized Islamic Hajj by some governments in Africa has contributed to a subtle contest for public space and recognition that has occurred between Christianity and Islam. Much of this contest takes place within the political arena. In Nigeria, things have spilled over, leading to physical clashes and even bombing of churches during worship, especially in the Muslim North. In Ghana, Christianity is the dominant religion, as we have noted. Christian missionary education dating back to the middle of the 19th century meant that evangelization took place through formal education. Until fairly recently, most important public office holders were either partisan Christians or persons with Christian education. The Muslims have felt disadvantaged, and from a position of suspicion of formal education through mission schools, they have now started to draw the attention of their communities to the importance of education for public life. There are many, now many Muslim basic high schools in Ghana, including an Islamic university. The Christians have gone on the offensive because they feel that the government is privileging Islam in many areas. It started in the mid-1990s with the introduction of two Muslim holidays. Ghana never had any national Muslim holidays until the mid-90s. Now the Muslims have been granted two, and I've also talked about the Zongo Development Fund that is going to benefit Muslim children. And so it looks like the Christians are requesting for this support to go to Jerusalem in order to equalize the benefits that they think the Muslims are gaining. But all this is working within our political system, the democratic political system, because the government sees it as an opportunity to court the religious votes of both Christians and Muslims. And now the political parties even make sure that those contesting for political office have, are people of a certain religious orientation. The governing party, for example, the New Patriotic Party, has a Christian president and then a Muslim vice president. And that kind of, those kinds of negotiation are going on all the time. And both Christian and Muslim leaders are consulted in these appointments. Supporting Muslim Hajj or pilgrimage is a major means by which various governments have sought to support the Islamic cause. Two Hajj villages have been set up by the government in Tamale and Accra, with the one in the capital located near the airport. It is for the fear of incurring the displeasure of the government and presumably that of the Muslim community that Christians may have kept silent over government support for the Muslim Hajj. Indeed, when in the midst of the media exchanges, the moderator of the Presbyterian Church of Ghana, the Right Reverend Professor Emmanuel Mate, a theologian, publicly called on the government to stop sponsoring Hajj, there was a swift response from a Muslim group through the internet, giving him 24 hours to withdraw the statement. That did not happen, but it raised a broader issue on the disquiet that the, that the suspected sponsorship and facilitation of the Hajj by government raises within sections of the Christian community. There were even readers' letters in a couple of newspapers from some members of the public, presumably Muslims, who pointed to several areas of Christian work in Ghana that receives government sponsorship. And so the system of re religious equalization goes on between Christians and Muslims. As we have noted, historically, Jerusalem has had more significance for Christianity than any other city in the Middle East. 
Jerusalem is the first city in which Jesus went through the major events culminating in his crucifixion. Jerusalem is the city where the disciples were expected to wait for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And it's also the city that holds some of the major landmarks of the Christian faith as reported in the Gospels. <coughs> the book of Revelation also talks about a new heaven and a new earth and of the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from heaven. The reference in the scriptures to Jerusalem as a heavenly city has given its earthly version added significance within the political developments of Ghana and other countries. Theologically, Jerusalem has remained in the Christian imagination as a replica of the place where Christians will spend eternity. And this biblical image of the descent of Jerusalem as a heavenly city inspired Bernard of Cluny in his 12th century hymn, Jerusalem the Golden. One of the stanzas of that hymn reads, O sweet and blessed country, the home of God's elect. O sweet and blessed country, that eager hearts expect. Jesus, in mercy, bring us to that dear land of rest, who art with God the Father and Spirit ever blessed. This hymn, together with the hymn, Jerusalem, my happy home, is commonly sung, sung at Christian funerals to indicate the destination of those who serve God faithfully when they depart this life. Jerusalem, in keeping with Revelation, has survived in the Christian imagination as an eschatological city that will descend from God. And I believe um, Jerusalem, my happy home, is a very, very common hymn. Jerusalem, my happy home, name ever dear to me, when shall my labors have an end in joy and peace in thee? When all these eyes, thy heavily built walls and pearly gates behold, thy bulwarks with salvation strong and streets of shining gold. It says, Jerusalem, my happy home, my soul pants for thee. Then shall my labors have an end, then when I thy joys shall see. So traditionally, Jerusalem exists in the Christian imagination as a place representing where Christians will be for eternity. But in the present context of pilgrimages, it has been reinvented as a Mecca, the equivalent of Mecca in Islam, where Christians go on pilgrimage. And my point is that multi-party democracy is fueling these sort of developments in which Christians are requesting for funds to go on pilgrimage to Mecca. Let me try and conclude. Such hymns as I have narrated, Jerusalem the Golden and Jerusalem my happy home, can help believers think about themselves by providing a framework for reflecting upon contemporary experiences and giving life a sense of direction. For those who have had the opportunity to visit Jerusalem, and its related cities for religious reasons, it has served the purpose of bringing the Bible alive in terms of some of the descriptions of the ministry of Jesus Christ. In the course of the public discussion on the appropriateness or otherwise of the proposed Christian pilgrimage to Israel, it emerged that some Pentecostal charismatic Christians in Ghana who have been there in the past have even sought rebaptism in the Jordan seeing that as more authentic than their earlier baptism in Ghanaian waters. The visit to Jerusalem, which is undertaken by Christians all over the world, has for many years generated into a major tourist endeavor. Given the level of interest, many tour companies have established regular trips for Christians and non-Christians alike who are interested in visiting Jerusalem. In the minds of those inclined towards its theological import, however, it is considered important to institutionalize pilgrimages to Israel in order to put it on the same pedestal as the Islamic Hajj. So what we have in this presentation is a situation in which Christians have tried 
to establish their own pilgrimage site, although religiously and theologically speaking, this does not exist in the scriptures, or if you like, in conventional Christian theology. theology. An important part of these developments that most of the arguments miss, though, is that there is a whole Christian Zionist movement that has emerged within Pentecostalism in particular. Indeed, in conversation with a leading Ghanaian Pentecostal pastor who favored the Jerusalem pilgrimage, he was keen to point to the historical importance of the nation of Israel in the Christian faith, citing that as an important reason for every Christian to try and visit the place. An important international voice in this movement is the Catholic charismatic theologian Peter Hawking, who writes that Israel is the soil of the incarnation. God's dealings with the chosen people always reflect a relationship between the particular and the universal, between the chosen people and all the nations of the earth, for whose sake the elect are chosen. End of quote. The attempt to create a Christian equivalent of Mecca by seeking to hold Jerusalem as being as important to the Christian faith as Mecca is to Islam raises critical issues that affect both political developments and theological matters. In the political arena, the sponsorship of religious pilgrimage seems to serve the interests of the various governments in terms of allegiance, support, and votes. In the theological realm, Christian pilgrimages may be undertaken as an important part of personal and communal renewal. However, the submissions of Jesus Christ and the subsequent post-resurrection history of the faith indicate that there is really no geographical center meant to be the focus of the Christian encounter with God. In the words of Paul to the Athenians, who sought to domesticate God in the erection of a physical abode dedicated to an unknown God, Paul says, from one man, he made every nation of men that they should inhabit the whole earth, and he determined the time set for them and the exact places where they should live. God did this so that men would seek him and perhaps find him, though he is not far from each one of us. End of quote. In other words, Paul seems to be suggesting God is spirit, and those who seek to worship him must do so in spirit and in truth. Jerusalem, I conclude, may be significant for some reason, but God, but Christianity, has no black stone to which we are required to repair for religious credits. So my point is that if Christians, some Christians have money and they want to visit Jerusalem, um, there is nothing wrong with that. But the attempt to institutionalize the place as equivalent, the Christian equivalent of Mecca, does not fit the theological importance of Jerusalem within Christianity. Thank you very much. So I recently learned about a case study in Canada um, about a Jewish school in Ontario that was seeking funding for the school from the government. Um, and it uh, was a, a case that went up to the Supreme Court, I believe, in Canada because um, in their constitution um, there is um, some reference to there being uh, funding available for pro Protestant schools. Um, and it went all the way up to the Supreme Court and sort of more recent amendments to the Constitution that talk about um, sort of having uh, more equity between religious communities. Um, they thought that those newer amendments would sort of outweigh the older constitutional guidelines. Um, but it went up to the Supreme Court and they upheld the original Constitution and said that still, you know, we will only fund Protestant schools um, with the idea that if we start funding 
more than Protestant schools, we're funding all schools at this point. So I wonder if there's in sort of the Ghanaian context a similar, um, so I understand that it's a, the government that's controlling a lot of this, but whether there's um, sort of constitutional um, limitations to it, and if there um, have been sort of, if it is something that has been, you know, even taken to a court in Ghana, um, if that has happened. Yeah, thank you. Now, um, officially, Ghana is described as a secular state in the constitution. And even what we are calling mission schools are now um, virtually sponsored by the government. So they are actually mission schools in name. So you will find um, so so and so Catholic primary school or Catholic high school or Methodist high school or Presbyterian high school or primary school. Um, they were started by the missionaries, but they are now all government owned. Government pays the teachers. Um, and um, so whether you attend a Catholic school or you attended um, a Methodist school, um, it's still paid for by the government. The churches have some limited role, and their support is so welcome. Um, but in practice, most of the schools are sponsored by the government. Now, what the churches or religious institutions, particularly Christian, uh, Christianity and Islam, what they have started to do now is to set up private schools over which they would have complete control. In fact, a number of these schools even take foreign exams, like Cambridge exams, and a lot of the children who attend these schools are from middle class homes, so they can afford to attend universities abroad, and so on and so forth. So uh, we have ha we've not had that sort of situation in which somebody has to go to court to contest these things. But everybody understands that it's a political game. Um, because until the Christians started asking for sponsorship to go to Jerusalem, um, it was public knowledge that the Muslims were receiving some support. But the point is that multi-party multi -party democracy has brought that development to sharper focus. You know, and people feel that if the government is going to continue to sponsor um, Islamic events, then we may as well ask for a, a share of the of the cake because after all we had the majority. That's that seems to be um, the argument that Christians are, are making. Um, I don't know what is going to happen in future, and whether this is even sustainable at all. But I can say to you that in the past two or three decades, the Muslim presence in Ghana has become a bit more pronounced. Um, and the Christians feel um, that part of that visibility comes from political patronage, for example. Um, and as I said, the political parties, the two main political parties in Ghana, um, go out of their way to make sure that Muslims are represented um, at the high, highest level. Um, and I think mainly for... Uh, for votes and so on. So we're not sure how that is going to end, but we don't, we don't have that kind of uh, legal uh, case yet. There's a hand there. Yes, sir. Is it also possible that the part of the increasing visibility of Muslims in Ghanaian life has some external influences? Uh, I'm, I'm, I hope you, you are aware of some the documents out there about uh, meetings by Muslim countries with a view to gaining control you know, of various African countries, having Sharia laws, and so on and so forth. So I don't think it's entirely an, you know, uh, due to internal dynamics of the Ghanaian nation. Uh, I think that's an element of uh, external influence that is uh, behind the increasing feasibility. What do you think about that? Well, in terms of the public discourse on this, um, people refer to the external influences, too. In fact, um, the Ghanaian public, the Christian public in particular, was very concerned that our last president, John Mahama, although um, was a Christian, um, I think visited Dubai um, 
many, 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 many times, including spending uh, most of its holidays there. And as it turned out, there was sponsorship from that part of the world for various uh, projects in, in Ghana. In fact, um, the Islamic University, which I, I refer to, um, uh, is entirely uh, sponsored from um, one, um, one um, Islamic country and so on. So um, generally, people are aware, but unfortunately, uh, we usually don't come across the empirical evidence supported. Generally, people know that that, that is happening. And um, suddenly, when you drive around the various capital cities, uh, cities it is a striking how um, prayer places, Islamic prayer places, are springing up, um, are being squeezed into even residential areas, and uh, people are selling their property um, for Muslim causes. And so you find mosques everywhere. And people, yes, suspect that there is some external funding invo involved in all this. Sorry, the follow-up. When, when you talk about Imperial, we might say that they are anecdotal, mm -hmm. but the fact that you said the university was sponsored, that you have these you know, foreign funds coming in, is that not enough evidence to support the fact that there are some external influences if the funding is coming from uh, you know, outside sources? Yeah, I won't dispute that, but that's just one example that um, one can cite. The point I'm trying to make is that there is a suspicion. Uh, and there are many more projects around. Um, I refer to the Islamic, the, the Hajj village, for example. There's a huge facility near the airport where Muslims converge um, prior to embarking on the Hajj. And people suspect that the funding for building of the place uh, come from external sources. We have a new airport uh, in Tamale, which is the main city of the north. And um, we know that there's been uh, built into that airport a mosque. And uh, people, so the, the airport is, itself is being built by, by Brazilians, a Brazilian contractor. But uh, people believe that there is some sponsorship for that project uh, from the Arab world. And um, so the government was left with no option. Uh, we hear that the building of the mosque as part of the airport was one of the conditions for providing the, the, the resources. But what I'm saying is that I haven't cited them here because I don't have the, the evidence, the hard evidence to, to support it. But generally, yes, the Ghanaian public talks about these things. They know what is going on. Yes. Yeah, I'm struck. Uh, where you ended was that the pilgrimage is enshrined in Islam. Um, it's part of the code, yes. you know, the established code. Doesn't matter where Muslims live. Um, that obligation is part of the faith. And there is no such uniform uh, established institutional obligation for Christians, uh, even for Catholics, uh, really. That's really where you end it. And then the paradox that hits me, that strikes me in all of this, uh, internally, there seems to be, you talk about religious equalization, but in fact, the process of getting there is religious competition going on. And what strikes me here is the sort of lack of balance, really, between the fact that Muslims are fairly well organized around the pilgrimage. That's right. Fairly well organized. Uh, they don't have to debate about it. They don't have to discuss agreeing or not agreeing, when to go, where to go. <laughs> it's all set for them. Well, the Christians don't have that yes. advantage. Yeah. In order for Christians to really compete, it seems to me uh, the democratic party pluralism of Ghana requires Christians to play the political game. Um, the pilgrimage itself in Mecca, there are prayers for the pilgrimage where there is no political reference whatsoever. And the prayers, you know. Our prayers to God and memory of the, Muhammad, of, of the Prophet Muhammad and Mecca and Medina's holy cities and 
doing rituals that are not rationalized by any political criteria, rituals that are in imitation of the prophet. So even Saudi Arabia does not play a political role <laughs> in that pilgrimage as such. But Christians then find themselves having to play a political game in order to think that they might gain equality with Muslims. Is that strategy ultimately self-defeating for Christians? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Is that strategy self-defeating for Christians? Playing the political game. Hmm. I haven't thought about it. I haven't thought about it. But um, I have raised questions um, regarding whether the approach is the best. Because not only do the Christians have to deal with the Muslim community, they also have to deal with themselves. Because publicly, the Catholics and the mainline Protestants would come out and say, this is not the way to go. And then you have independent church pastors and leaders say, no, we should go with it. You know, so the Christians themselves are not speaking with one voice. You know, so uh, it's almost like, um, <laughs> so that, that's where I see, I see um, it being self-defeating. Uh, because one would, would have thought that if we're going to deal with it, then you just tell the government, get out of religious business. But they're not doing that, you know. So that's... <laughs> yes. Uh, in former President Mahama's uh, autobiography, or brief that he wrote, I remember him uh, saying that he had a strong feeling that the North in terms of education was neglected by the government and possibly by the churches too. And I, I wondered if the support for Muslims to go on Hajj then began under his presidency and also whether this might explain his embrace of help from the Middle East since he did, ha did have this strong feeling that the, uh, that the South had all the good stuff and all the support and the North was somewhat even though he was a Christian, basically. Yeah. So I, 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 I wondered whether, you know, his being a northerner had something to do with the beginning of support for the Hajj for the Muslims. Hmm, I, that's, that's a difficult one. Uh, because although he is a northerner, I think Mahama has spent a lot of time in the south. And interestingly, uh, he's not just, uh, he's not a mainline church Christian. He's an Assembly of God. It's a Pentecostal denomination, you know. And um, I think he's somebody who also goes to church regularly. Um, of course, in recent, um, during his, 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 his tenure, people questioning his Christian uh, commitment uh, because of certain things that happened and um, the, the leanings towards uh, the uh, Arab countries and so on, people, people question that. But I would think that this support comes more out of political considerations than, um, than anything else. Because although in terms of infrastructure, the North has suffered a lot. That is not the only place. In fact, the far west of Ghana is one of the most undeveloped places across the country, although uh, most of our resources come from there. Most of our natural resources in terms of gold and timber, uh, uh, bauxite, and so on, cocoa, come from the west. But everybody talks about the North. I think the underdevelopment in the North occurred because right from the start uh, it was determined that since that place was predominantly uh, Muslim, um, Christian evangelization there should be me measured. And you no know, Christian evangelization took place more through education. And so by the time everybody realized um, there were a lot of educated people in the South and Northness were not as, as educated, 
And there have also been been discussions in the country regarding why educated Northerners don't want to serve in that part of the country. You know, so we have a lot of uh, medical doctors and lawyers and so on who would prefer to serve in the South than to, to go up North. Uh, and that's, that's an issue still, still being, being debated. You know. Thank you. So m my point is that I think it's more out of political than uh, considerations than anything else. Yes, not, not, not because he comes from there. I was thinking about pilgrimage too, because Ethiopia has a long tradition mm -hmm. of pilgrimage uh, internally, and you would see Ethiopians going to Upper Egypt mm -hmm. in the second and third century for ISIS. Mm -hmm. So, is there? Does it make sense to African religious sensibilities this idea of pilgrimage? Is it a human? Uh, because we know in Egypt and Ethiopia, it's always been part of. We know Nubians. Mm. Do quite a few uh, pilgrimage, mm. and you know there was there was actually Ethiopians in Jerusalem in the fourth century, mm. shortly after they became kind of a Christian country. So it, it does seem like pilgrimage makes sense, maybe not to the modern religious mind, but in terms of kind of ancient religious traditions. Well, it's always been there. Pilgrimage has always been there. People like to connect with the sacred spaces that have meaning for their faith. Um, one of the most popular pilgrimage sites in Ghana today is a mountain, mountain called the Abesia Mountain. Some people call it Atria Mountain. And I have been there twice myself. Um, and, you know, um, people are now spending um, weeks on that mountain. And they travel from all over the country converge in the place to pray because a um, number of years ago, maybe 50 years ago, uh, a Methodist minister was driving around the place. Um, it's said to have heard a voice saying that that was a sacred mountain. And now, uh, you know, everything's been institutionalized. People go to Achua Mountains to pray. And uh, if you go there and look at the very um, difficult conditions under which people stay up there, you wonder. But, you know, um, for some of these places, the testimonies that go with it, that encourage uh, patronage. So the more people come with stories of healing, um, the more you find people going there. So there's, there's something in the human psyche that drives us to go on pilgrimage to, to places. I mean, just look at the average Catholic who steps in Rome for the first time. You know, uh, <laughs> kind of the Christianization of, of Europe mm -hmm. through relics mm -hmm. that these large uh, cathedral churches would have a uh, famous, like the relic of Saint Mark or the That's relics right. of Saint Peter. Yeah. So you would go to those. Yeah. So those cities became part of the Christian story in some ways, mm -hmm. uh, in ways that are that, but you don't find them in the Bible. But now they're considered yeah. Christian cities because of these relics. Yeah. Yeah. All kinds of things have developed. I mean, for a very long time, those of us who have shown interest in contemporary expressions of Christianity, like Pentecostalism, thought that uh, Pentecostalism is a movement without much ritual. But we can't say that anymore because sacred places, sacred personalities, even things that have touched their body, you know, have become very, very important. I refer to these things as the use of sacramentals, that is visible substances that convey invisible power. You, I'm sure you, you, you know or have heard about the Nigerian um, pastor, Enoch Adeboye. Enoch Adeboye is the leader of the Redeemed Christian Church of God. And Enoch Adeboye visited Ghana um, for religious revival. And after the meeting, Young Ghanaian pastors went to the, the seat on which he sat, rubbed their hands on the seat and, you know, themselves too, so that they can receive the same power on this Nigerian pastor, <laughs> on this Nigerian pastor, you know. And I'm surprised that these things are happening within contemporary Pentecostalism. And so um, I think the whole um, desire 
to connect with something more powerful, something secret, um, for whatever purposes, benefits that in near to people, um, is what translates into this idea of pilgrimage, visiting a place that has. Um, I, I don't know whether the, the tomb that we have uh, in Israel, uh, the Holy Land, as we call it now, where the tomb of Jesus, the actual tomb, because I debate this with the students, the sepulchre, that, I mean, we can't locate graves that are 100 years old. <laughs> so uh, we keep debating whether the sepulchre is actually the, the original one. And if there was any sense that this was really the original one, I don't think it would be there today. Because there was a Marian apparition in a part of Ghana. And the little boy who claims to have encountered this apparition went to tell his mother. And they had to go and call the Catholic priests to come and verify that this was a, a real apparition. By the time the Catholic authorities got there, there was no sand left in the place. People had collected all the sand. <laughs> You know, we were going to the sand to their homes, <laughs> so they found a uh, they found a you know a crater, you know a hole there, you know. So if that sepulchre was <laughs> conf is confirmed to be the real one, uh, people will collect the stones, they will break it, <laughs> and take take them away, you know. Well, so thank you. Very <laughs> <much>. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>